Every 20 minutes, the world adds another 3,500 human lives, but loses one or more entire species of animal or plant life, at least 27,000 species per year. At the present rates of extinction, as many as 20% of the world's 7 to 15 million species could be gone in the next 30 years. This rate of extinction has been unprecedented since the disappearance of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. A significant proportion of the blame of these outrageous statistics can be directed towards man-made pollution. Accordingly, a movement known as green chemistry has been created to reduce and prevent pollution at its source by encouraging the design of products and processes that minimize the use and generation of hazardous substances. Ideally, the green chemistry movement seeks to prevent the generation of hazardous waste entirely, as it is better to prevent waste than to treat or clean it up after it has been created. However, while complete elimination of waste is not exactly feasible, a more realistic goal is to ensure that the reactants in a process are used as efficiently as possible. A measure of this phenomenon is called the atom economy, which is defined as the ratio of the total mass of atoms in the desired products to the total mass of atoms in the reactants. In other words, the greater the atom economy, the more the materials used were incorporated into the final product. One way to improve the atom economy is to develop methods that monitor exactly how much waste is being produced in a particular process right at the moment at which it is being created. Real-time in-process monitoring would allow for quick and efficient management of waste. Also, having prior knowledge about the amount of waste to be created will weed out inefficient processes before they hurt the environment. Here are a few examples of the impact that a world of poor atom economies can have. Meet Harry, a brook trout who lives in a small lake up in the Adirondack Mountains of New York, close to a coal-burning power plant. The combustion of coal has released sulfur and nitric oxides, which are converted into sulfuric and nitric acids in the rain. This acid rain has just caused the pH of Harry's lake to drop to 4. Harry has just died. In order to prevent other fish like Harry from suffering a similar fate, synthetic methodologies like this must be designed to be less toxic towards the environment. Also, coal is a depleting feedstock, which means that it is not sustainable in the long term. What will happen when the world runs out of coal? Whenever possible, renewable raw materials should be used. Next, meet Paul the Polar Bear, who lives in the Polar Basin. Paul's position at the top of the Arctic food chain has resulted in high levels of persistent organic pollutants such as polychlorinated biphenyl, which are used in transformers, capacitors, and factory coolants, in his body. Accordingly, Paul's immune system has become severely weakened. Paul's body cannot fight off diseases as well as it should, and he has just died. In order to protect other animals at the tops of food chains like Paul from being destroyed in a similar manner, inherently safer chemicals must be created. Now this is Dennis, a duck who lives by an oil refinery in Louisiana, close to the Gulf of Mexico. When an oil spill occurs in the area, the refining company uses industrial solvents in an attempt to fix the mess, but these solvents are not environmentally safe and end up causing more harm than good. The lakes and streams where Dennis spends much of his free time have become contaminated by the industrial solvents. And as a result, Dennis too has been killed. To protect the wildlife and prevent the pollution of their habitats, as well as to avenge Dennis's death, safer solvents must be employed instead of the current hazardous ones. In addition, environmentally unsafe solvents also have the potential to cause accidents when used to try to mitigate oil spills. Safer solvents are less likely to cause an explosion or fire, and are therefore favorable. This is Myrtle the Turtle, who lives near a factory in the San Francisco Bay Area. The workers of this factory use non-biodegradable plastic bags to transport their materials in and out of the factory. However, after the plastic bags serve their industrial purpose, they are often found in the environment. Myrtle just mistook one of these bags for a jellyfish meal and died. In fact, more than 100,000 animals are killed every year due to plastic bags. And worse, the ingested plastic bag remains intact even after the death and decomposition of the animal. To prevent such unfortunate occurrences, 
biodegradable products should be designed and used as much as possible. Now we come to Larry the Zebrafish, who lives in a lake in the northeastern United States near a steroid manufacturing facility. The facility relies upon the Woodward reaction, which uses a stoichiometric derivative multi-step process that releases harmful waste. Silver salts have contaminated Larry's surroundings, making him unable to reproduce. Eventually, Larry dies. To prevent a repeat of Larry's circumstances, a more efficient, catalytic, single-step process is highly recommended. Last but not least, we turn the clock forward a century or two and come to Don the Giant Bufo Toad in Hawaii. The excess carbon dioxide from hundreds of years of combustion reactions has increased global temperatures, melting the polar ice cap and rising sea levels. Hawaii has now become completely submerged, demolishing Don and his entire habitat. To mitigate such damage, chemical processes must be analyzed for the environmental as well as their economic impacts. Energy efficiency must be improved.